Hello everybody, um, welcome to Not Stopping Festival. Um, my name's Josh Astori Pickering and I'm from Nottingham Castle Trust where I'm the Community Engagement and Participation Officer. Uh, we've got a project called Voices of Today. Uh, it's a film project that we were planning to, to get up and running from February, March, uh, but COVID-19 has obviously um, changed things for everybody. For us, it's meant that the project has had to change as well. Uh, we've moved a lot of it online, uh, digitally, and we're trying to remotely go out to people and get people involved. We still have the, the bigger project, the film project in mind, and that's going to be coming later this year. But in the meantime, what we've been doing during lockdown for people is trying to scope out people's um, ideas around the themes that we're looking at in this film. And one of the ideas, one of the, the asks that we had of people was to get them to send us in artistic responses to those themes. The themes that we're talking about are rebellion, riot, protest, activism, and generally standing up for what you believe in and uh, against the oppressive forces that, that want to stop us from being creative. In Nottingham, we've got a great tradition of that. Uh, it's a huge part of our story as a city, and it's something that we're going to be exploring a lot at Nottingham Castle when we reopen in February 2021. And so what we asked people to do was, yeah, get their creative responses to those things in. Um, we had a great response in the first couple of weeks to, to that call out. I'm really happy to be joined here today by three of the artists who sent us in their, their submissions. Uh, we've got Phil Formby, Martina McBrity and Ravi Abbott. Um, and I think what we'll probably do before we get into to talking in, in a bit more depth with them all is just to get each of them to go around and, and say a little bit about who they are and what kind of thing they do. So uh, yeah, let's start with Phil. Um, could you tell us just briefly a little bit about um, who you are and what you do, Phil? Well, hi, I'm Phil. Um, I'm a filmmaker and photographer. Um, and I don't know more to say than that, really. I'm, um, it's hard to say what, what, what my work involves because I'm just, I just work and grind, <laughs> whatever interests me, really. Uh, so that's me. Well, we've got a, um, a photo that, that you submitted for Voices of Today, which will, I'm going to try with the technology and bring it up. I'm doing Zoom on my phone for the first time. So what I'm going to try and do is bring up your picture um, and share it, um, the one that you submitted, and then we'll, we'll have a little bit more of a talk about that um, when we do that. Cheers, Phil. Um, Martina? Hi. Hi. Um, I, I'm Martina. Um, I've been uh, doing painting for quite a while, went to art college, etc. Um, this project interested me, the, the conflict theme in particular, um, and it was, um, it, was, uh, it was related to um, Northern Ireland, so um, I haven't been on Zoom now, <laughs> so <laughs> um, but um, not much else to say really. Um, I, I'm looking forward to talking about the work, etc. Yeah, great. We, we are going to... i nervous. <laughs> oh, don't worry. Don't worry. This is, yeah. No pressure. We're, um, we're going to show your piece of work as well, like, like Phil's, okay. the one that you submitted, and we'll, um, we'll have a good chat around that, and I'm sure we'll okay. all have a lot to say about it. Um, but it's yeah, a great piece of work, as you're all going to see very soon. Um, Ravi. Could you tell us a little bit about yourself as well, please? Uh, yeah, so I'm really into communities and um, kind of telling the stories about communities. At the moment, I run a podcast, which is all about video games. And we kind of talk about the different themes in video games and communities. But also, I'm doing like a few videos and documentary stuff here and there for YouTube. And uh, I'm really nerdy about Nottingham history as well. I love Nottingham history. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, brilliant. We, we've definitely got a lot in common on that front. Um, and I, I do think um, the three of you and, and the four of us actually um, have got lots of common threads that I think are going to, I hope, are going to um, become apparent when we, when we have this conversation. Um, what I'm going to try and do now is share the first of the images, which is Phil's. Uh, let's have a little look. Oh dear, I don't think I can. <laughs> <coughs> I tell you what, we will put it in the 
comment section and we'll get everyone to have a look. What you might actually be able to do, what a good, a good idea could be is to pause the video. This is um, a pre-recorded video, of course, and what you might be able to do is just give it a pause and go onto Twitter, which is where all of these were posted originally. And okay. so on that one, if you, if you want to check out Phil's and equally Martina and Ravi's submissions for the uh, Voices of Today project, I would advise you yeah, to go on to Twitter, to Nottingham Castle, or just type in the hashtag Voices of Today with Phil, uh, Phil Formby, Martina McBritty, or Ravi Abbott, and you'll be able to scroll down and uh, find those. But Phil, um, let's just chat a little bit about yours. Um, you submitted a photograph to us. Um, it was a picture of a Weatherspoons pub, or more precisely, a picture of some graffiti on the side of a Weatherspoons pub on one of their doors. Uh, that said pay your staff and this was taken uh, at the beginning of the crisis the COVID-19 crisis uh, it's yeah something that I think we've seen in a couple of places I think there was this might have been like a copy a copycat kind of thing where it had been seen and posted online and gone a bit viral and then someone had done it locally to where we live which is in the Sherwood area of Nottingham and yeah, it, it, I think your photo was taken from inside a shop across the street. Is that correct? Uh, well, through a bus stop window. It was a bus stop, was it? Yeah. Yeah. And and we can see a reflection in that um, in that pane of glass of uh, a notice that's talking about COVID nineteen. So it, it's quite nicely composed. I think it's you've got that kind of backwards writing of COVID nineteen and a bit of instructions, and then you've got this visually quite striking. Um, writing on the door in big yellow paint um that came uh, that came at the time when weatherspoons were saying i think that they weren't they were going to freeze pay for, for about forty three thousand workers nationwide um until they had a rescue plan that that was given to them by the government other companies at the time greg's and costa i think and some of the some of the coffee chains were saying that they were going to pay people for four weeks at least until they had a better idea of what was going on but Weatherspoons didn't, and they <laughs> they said that they were going to freeze pay. From the pressure just after that, they they backtracked and eventually did pay. Um, when you when you took that picture, when you were walking down the street, what struck you about that message when you saw it? Well, I mean, it was just so visceral. <laughs> it's straight away. It's in your face. It's exactly. It's sort of reflecting the sentiment of the time. Everybody was stressed out. Nobody knew what was going to what was going to happen. And obviously, um, when you've got sort of millionaires acting like mercenaries, just sort of cutting off their staff force, um, go get a job in Tesco's or whatever it was he, he said to his staff. Mm. Um, I just thought it was a really beautiful and succinct way to say "fuck you," basically, if you want to say mm. that. Um, so what you want mate and it's as simple as that really yeah i found it quite ironic actually that um sort of during the whole brexit situation um the the weatherspoons news pamphlet or magazine was like extremely politicized and to a cap to a captive audience of the people who drink in those pubs cheap pubs you know um and I just thought it was a nice little reversal to to put a, a different message on the front of a Weatherspoons establishment. Um, so yeah, it struck me just in terms of its imagery it was quite, I mean, it was a gift really. I just thought, yeah, I mean, great. I'll photograph that. And on I yeah, went. And it, it is a, it's, yeah, it's a really nice picture. Um, when, you, when you compose something like that, I'm, I mean, for those of you who've, who've now since paused and had a look at it or are going to do that now, um, you'll see um, the way that Phil shot it and you've got that image at the side of, well, that reflection at the side of the, the COVID-19 message. Um, when you composed that, was that, were you, were you already planning to take that picture when you saw, what did, what did you see first? I'm, I'm just trying to get an idea of your, your process really with that. Yeah, did you see the, the door first or did you see the COVID-19 at the same time through through the bus stop? No, I mean, I already knew it was there um, and I'd, I'd, I'd sort of driven past it. So I was like, oh, I've got to go back and get a picture of that. Um, and also your project had just come up and I was like, well, that's perfect sort of thing. 
Uh, so yeah, I sort of went back and I took a few shots from different angles. But um, yeah, I just as I was walking by, there was the reflection. I was like, well, that's that's pretty much as good as it's going to get, really. Yeah. So brilliant. just just so, trial and error. I took about three different angles, and that was that was the one that worked. Okay. Is that what? What would you can you, could you say anything about your process in general when you're taking photos, um, artistic pics when you're you're out and about? Are you are you looking for stuff, or does it do you kind of happen upon stuff more often? Um, well, and, and how much of it is sorry? How much of it is then? Um, trial where you're, you're testing it from a few different angles as you say and how much of it is um really this is where i've seen it from this is where where i want it to be from and taking it and and doing what you can artistically from that from that spot do you have different approaches around that yeah i think it depends on, on what you're working on really um obviously if you can tell as much of a story in in a single image as, as possible then that's ideal so COVID-19 in the in the reflection and I mean it's all it's all there in one image it's perfect but then I suppose if you're working on a more long-term project uh, you're building up a story through lots of different images and the same with film documentary it's it's a different process um, so yeah I mean if, specifically for that I'm, I've been taking part in the photo parlor Nottingham parlor games they're doing a little photo sort of weekly task and they give different um, instructions each week and you sort of go along and, and try and fulfill the, the brief. Um, and it's just, it's just been really nice because I've been furloughed. So usually I'm flat out doing other things and trying to find time to do my own projects, but sort of, I suppose just playing and having fun with it. It's been a nice departure. Great. So yeah. yeah. That's, that's one of the things I wanted to touch on as well was, um, your your approaches to this particular call out and and this this project um we one of the main reasons we put it out was with people's health and well-being and um their their situation during lockdown in mind as well and we we know that art and heritage and the the kind of world that we operate in um contributes quite quite significantly for a lot of people to to their health and well-being their mental health and there's a gap there obviously with everything closed so one of our main motivations in, in moving this stuff um, to a digital platform and, and making uh, remote activities for people was to to provide that kind of thing so yeah hearing hearing about how that impacted for you um, is is definitely something I'm, I want to know something that's of interest to me um, have you been, how have you been during this uh, have you have you been doing lots of creative things Phil yeah yeah it's been it's been um apart from the sort of obvious stress of the situation um in terms of my own day-to-day -day, it's been uh i've took my foot off the gas it's been quite nice to sort of relax a little bit um so obviously i'm not i'm going back to work at the beginning of june mm. uh, but i've had a, a solid two months furloughed uh so yeah just just uh, starting all those sort of projects that have been in the back of your mind and sort of getting busy but things like your project and uh, the voice of today and and as I said the photo parlors project is especially at the beginning was a real lifeline to just sort of take your mind off all the chaos that's going on and just go okay well I can just focus on that for a little bit um, yeah I think it's been really important that these things have continued to all these sort of organizations have continued to throw out keep us occupied i suppose yeah and it is yeah it's worth definitely saying that there's there's a lot out there at the moment um in nottingham and, and further afield um a lot of our our city partners and, and other organizations are doing doing stuff and not stopping is of course a great example of that they're they're putting out loads of interesting stuff this weekend um that's worth checking out um is that something martina and ravi that that you're um finding is difficult the the creative side of things or are you finding that there's loads out there for you as well that you're you're tapping into uh, martina could you say anything about that um it's easier um i'm a single parent so it's 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 easier for me to get some art in at night especially since the routines off you know what i mean so i would usually do work at night um 
and as a result get up you know early the next morning for for work and as a result become exhausted so this has given me time sort of to think about my art more do you know what I mean and get back into it because it's not a priority as it doesn't make me any money so <laughs> um, yeah. it's become um, more of a priority now and I've even started using you know I've even started doing some you know, but more conventional stuff as well, like portraits and stuff, um, which I wouldn't have focused on before because my usual art is a bit quicker and it's, it's got quicker, I think, because of my uh, situation. So I find that this has allowed me to slow down and also look at other topics as well. And history is very important to me as well. You know what I mean in my work? I love history, um, especially social history and uh, you know, conflict history and so on, colonial history, etc. So it's given me time to do a bit of reading and so on and so forth. And hopefully some of those themes will come out, you know what I mean? Um, so I've definitely become more artistic since since this. It's given us time, really, given us our time back, yeah. I think, you know. So creative people are quite happy during this time, I think. Uh, yeah, I think so. <laughs> I don't um, want to admit it, but <laughs> <laughs> this is great. <laughs> I mean, yeah, amidst all the all the kind of chaos going on out there and, and the obvious um, tragedy of the situation, um, yeah. I think a lot of people are finding that they do have the time to, to kind of focus on things and, and spend a bit more time on the things that they, they like doing creatively. Um, but even even when they are suffering from tragedy and, and loss and loneliness and a lot of the mental health issues that, that come with a situation like this, um, I think a lot of people as well are discovering the, the real value of creative work and of uh, some of the stuff that they can get involved in, which is, which is really good. Um, Ravi, are you, um, are you in the same kind of boat? I know you're doing a lot with your, your podcast. Um, yeah. are, you, are you finding the time to, or more time, as Martina says. Well, I, I did kind of, I started working from home about a year ago. So I was kind of on my own in this online space. And now more people are joining me for like projects like this. And, and it seems like a lot of people that before would be too busy with work or trying to get other stuff are actually now able to get involved in more creative projects. And there certainly seems to be a lot more content coming out from all directions and that's really cool. I think it's a bit of a, I think it's a bit of a kick in the ass actually for the um, art world uh, to to digitize and to kind of, you know, come out into this online space where in England I didn't feel we were engaging that well with the online world and the kind of other than locally, you know, and getting the stories kind of worldwide. So it's it's really really change things and I think people are, are, are going to be creating more music they're going to be creating more pieces of art more photography more paintings uh, in this time and there's going to be some good good counterculture coming out of this I feel yeah there are some interesting um, articles at the moment going around about the the kind of art and, and create creative um, work that that booms and flourishes in times like this and especially ones where people are, are staying at home quite a lot and I've seen some parallels uh, being drawn with the renaissance period and um, with with the plague when everyone was locked in I've seen one yeah. thing talking about how Shakespeare supposedly wrote three of his plays in one year while he was locked down as well quarantined because of plague I'm and really stuff. um excited to see what music's going to come out after this yeah. when this finishes if there's a big party scene big raves mm. see, see what happens everybody's <laughs> going to be up for it so <laughs> well it'll be interesting as well with social distancing how how stuff like that happens um and i think we'll we'll probably touch on that a little bit more when we when we look at your piece in particular when we, we talk about um that social aspect of, well, of I, getting I, together. I saw the return of drive-in cinemas mm. the other day and i think that's a pretty cool thing <laughs> you know socially oh, yeah but all watch a film I think I did see, I think it was Berlin maybe where they had a drive-in rave. Yeah. A couple, couple of weeks ago. Yeah. So we all have to get a, a car. Drink <laughs> <me either. laughs> yeah, like you keep car going your bicycle. <laughs> yeah, man. Boris yeah. Spike. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. <laughs> Um, just before we move on to uh, to looking at Martina's piece in a, a bit of detail, um, I just wanted to 
to look at the idea of graffiti as well, which uh, features in Phil's photograph, obviously. And in this case, it was it, it wasn't so much an artistic piece of graffiti in in its um, composition, perhaps, uh, but it was done in a way that was, I think, supposed to look striking and look good. There was an artistic element behind it. Um, in a way, Phil, you've submitted a piece of art looking at a piece of art and we we just wanted people to send in whatever their perspectives or experiences of those themes were rebellion and protest and activism you've taken a picture of somebody else's expression of protest um and perhaps in do in so doing given your own expression of protest in i'm, I'm not gonna gonna attach any um any perspective to that um because I, I can't speak for you but um it's a bit meta isn't it and you well it's um yeah it's amplified i mean it's part of the part of the part of the joy of sort of graffiti as as protest is that it well it's it's territorial isn't it it's taking back the streets that people walk you know it feels like it's come from the people so to speak um it's not what you're sort of being served up it's what somebody decided you need to know um so i think that's quite an interesting part of it but also it's interesting that now that we are all living more digitally and that was happening before this anyway um yeah i suppose to photograph it and to put it into the online space is is to amplify it but yeah it certainly wasn't my uh it wasn't born out of nothing it wasn't me who came up with it somebody else said that and i i suppose agreed <laughs> and you know remixed it i suppose yeah yeah nice um what what do we um what do we feel about graffiti um it's i think we as, as long as you go back in history as far as you can go back there's uh graffiti being used as a political tool uh people writing messages trying to um incite ideas or protest as well against against things against authority often you go back to ancient rome and you've got people denouncing other political factions and you've got uh, the french revolution where um where people are ra doing rallying calls really for the cause and just well, to yeah all, all the way through history you've got, you've got it yeah one of the oh, interesting positive? sorry go ahead uh, sorry sorry for um it's uh it it should be positive it should be used because it's had it has a positive purpose of protest but i find in some times in our history graffiti has been used for the opposite mm. you know what i mean whether it be like uh supporting some sort of group or, or or whatever but it still remains a kind of uh, uh anonymous uh form of free speech i suppose you know what i mean Mm. It's anonymous, it's the nominality of it that makes it good and it, it's better than uh, the internet because it, you know people can see it walking past in their lives and, and so on but as an art form it is it is truly um, a, a, a form of protest. I used to do it in Belfast um, but I did it as an experiment for art college um, because I thought well if I'm going to do my final uh, piece of writing on graffiti I should do some but um, I did the graffiti piece and then uh, the UDA came along and sort of wrote a threat on it. So that was the end of it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, um, I think that Apparently I was the Ormo graffiti <laughs> master, right? Ormo graffiti master, be careful. So I just, I just sort of left it. But it was quite interesting to do like sort of like, uh, you know, hip hop origin graffiti next to political graffiti you know what i mean i was trying to counteract whatever they were doing you know when they didn't like it so we just we just lefty sure. <laughs> anonymity always very important you know <laughs> I'd, I'd agree ravi ravi were you going to add something to that yeah i think with phil's one it was um i'd noticed before that there was a lot of graffiti which was trying to do a positive slant on stuff in nottingham so you had that have a lovely day which yeah. seemed to be all around the city and then when it becomes a crisis or a situation like that you've got pay your workers you know yeah. and it was a bit more kind of direct whereas the other stuff seemed a bit more just kind of 
smile. I saw smile a lot of places, and I found I found that quite patronising a little bit. <laughs> I was like, no, I want to be miserable. <laughs> but there, there was some uh, some some kind of positive graffiti going in in Nottingham. Uh, yeah, for a while actually. Yeah, but that I think that's all disappeared now. Covid's happened. Might come back afterwards. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, what was really interesting about that particular. The, the Weatherspoons graffiti there it was um, they they kept putting it on and it kept getting painted over and then they kept putting it back again with slightly different um, and that was you know as an outsider that was quite fun but um, what I did what what ended up happening was we've got a, a sort of community uh, forum in Sherwood um, and somebody posted a request whoever's putting the graffiti on Weatherspoons can you stop? Because the reality <laughs> of the situation. Now, this isn't this isn't Tim Martin asking you to stop. This is somebody who was paid quite low, having to go out in a crisis and paint over the graffiti over and over again. So it was the, the message was: although we don't disagree necessarily with what you're saying here, the reality of the people that this affects are the same people that you're trying to protect. So, in the end, but and then and respectfully, in the end, they obviously got the message because it stopped, and and. So it's, it's interesting, isn't it, that, mm. um, you know, as an image, it's really striking. Uh, how much effect did it have? I don't know. It's about changing yes. people's perceptions and mindsets. But I think if you're already it's, sort of, if you're already of that persuasion, then you just look at it and sort of go, huh, yeah, great, pat on the back. Yeah. <clears throat> I think in a place as well like Sherwood, which is a suburb of Nottingham and is, um, relatively affluent i would say um certainly certainly middle class um it possibly didn't change too many people's opinions in the immediate area but um i think it probably was shared a fair bit online and, and got further out there i know that the i don't know if it's the original but what another version of the same kind of thing that was written on a weather spoons pub in south london uh went viral and, and picked up a lot of attention um and it was a, a part of that big backlash against Tim Martin and his comments that um, and eventually I, I assume played a part in them reversing their decision. Absolutely. I think the government got involved as well. But. Yeah, it's totally, I mean, it's, it's, it was an important thing to say, I think. Um, it was worth saying. And uh, I mean, it, it speaks to the, it's quite, it's quite nice that they sort of heard the sort of uh, the reasonable request to stop and went, yeah, fair enough. <laughs> Point made, move on, <laughs> find another battle. <laughs> Politely. Yeah. yeah. I think the government did say they would be forced to, to reverse the decision <laughs> and get involved. <laughs> but uh, yeah, the, pre the pressure was definitely on. Um, I think uh, we should probably move on. Um, thanks, Phil. That's um, your, your insights into that were brilliant. Um, and again, I'd say to everybody, get um, on Twitter and have a look at that. Um, it's, it's a really good uh, photograph that um, was... Yeah, one of my my favourite entries into the to the Voices of Today project. Uh, so cheers, Martina. Um, again, your your image is available yeah. on Twitter for people to have a look. Um, I posted that myself on there. Um, I don't believe you're on Twitter, are you? Or are you? Perhaps uh, I think you, you might have liked it, but I think I posted it for you, did I? Yeah, yeah, yes, yes, yes. I'm not on Twitter um, usually. Not really. Yeah, yeah when I get time, you know what I mean? But um, I saw it on Twitter, it was, it was, it was, it was good. And there were some nice uh, reactions to it. Amazing, um, we, we all loved it. So, so that went around the team at um, Nottingham Castle and um, everybody commented on how, how beautiful it was. First of all, um, how the lines and the colors and the strong images in it really, really said something to, to quite a few people who, who saw it. And we, we got, random people commenting on it on Twitter saying saying how beautiful it was as well um, something that I, um, I I definitely share uh, as an opinion um, you you did that collage uh, a collage is what it is sorry I haven't explained that um, you, you did it uh, by yeah. putting together photographic images and then some of your own um, drawing and, and coloring and it's an image that comes from the Troubles in Northern Ireland where you grew up. Um, and you've said to me that the, the piece yeah. reflects for you the way that children protested in their mind. Um, could, you, could you maybe 
expand yeah. on that a little bit and tell us what that means and how you how you try to show that in your work. Oh, have we lost you? She's frozen. Well, probably the worst oh, no. years. Oh, you have frozen. you lost? Have you lost sorry, me? Martina, sorry. You, yeah. You froze. Uh, during. Could, yeah, uh, can you hear me now? Start again with that. Sorry, you just went away. We can. Um, yeah. During during that time, that was 1972, 1974. Um, the children were used as kind of like, um, uh, basically in, the, in, in Derry, et cetera, they would have been sent out to stone the soldiers and the soldiers would not have been able to shoot back and retaliate. But at the same time, there was a sniper there. You know what I mean? So they were part of the war. And um, the way that we dealt with it when mm -hmm. we were younger was basically it was normal you understand it was normalized to us it was it was a kind of a thing so the imagery is all about how the child is standing there they're, they're not um phased most of the children in northern Ireland aren't phased by guns which is quite scary um that they would not be scared of a machine gun like or they would not be scared of uh, someone walking down the street with a gun um which is actually quite shocking to think that children at around that time um, we're actually exposed to all of this stuff, especially in Belfast and uh, Derry, London, Derry. Uh, and um, for they still haven't really uh, kind of dealt with the post trauma of it, you know what I mean? Um, and they were given the kids at the time uh, adult drugs to sort of calm them down, you know what I mean? Because they were mm. just, and none of this post traumatic stress has been dealt with. Um, things like children, uh, when they go into the nursery, they would start making guns. And the games were stop and search by the army or let's play sniper IRA. If you watch any of the documentaries from 1974, the children and the troubles. So the whole thing is about how they saw their world and what their world was. Um, there's a lot of flowers and imagery and stuff. And that's the way I saw my childhood, even though I grew up in Tyrone is a little bit less of the violence. I did go and study in Belfast, so um, that's when I saw the, the, the real separation as such within the communities. Um, coming from a farmer farming community where people interact with each other, regards the troubles um, and moving to Belfast and sort of seeing that, you know, that true separation was there. And um, you, you kind of cut out the, the violence as a child and you sort of replace it with whatever you can deal with. Um, so for many children, um, those streets were their play areas and I suppose the flowers and stuff represent what, what their imagination was um, because the army man is actually pointing, and it's not towards a child but it's in the child's direction but that's not towards the child if you know what I mean, that's he's in a sniper position to check out it's the child standing in front of him um, and it's basically um, representing how we as children dealt with trauma do you know what I mean not knowing it was trauma at the end of the day sure. because it was yeah because it's only when we come out of the troubles or when we moved somewhere else or even when we went on holiday to the republic that we realized how freaking mental it was to have a uh, an army in the UK, which was pretty strange all around. And not only that, it also represents what the soldiers went through as well, because as far as I'm concerned, yeah, we did have the Catholic Protestant, we did have the terrorists, but you know what I mean? The soldiers were there with us as well, you know what I mean? And very often, um, target of hate. And very often these guys had left their homes 18. Again, working class boys being sent over to Ireland without a clue. And, and to be walking around housing estates that they probably had lived in, the same model in the UK must have been pretty mental for most of them, do you know what I mean? And having spoken to a few soldiers as well who were uh, there during the Troubles, we, we see that we were in it together, do you know what I mean? Because they were as confused as we were and they were involved in the bullshit as much as we were. Um, so, you know, you can see that that photograph is supposed to represent that we were all in it together, but also uh, how how children deal with things and trauma, you know. Uh, That's really interesting. Yeah, yeah that, that shared experience and, and, and how you've included the soldier in that in that image as well. Um, yeah, I, I think a lot of well, maybe 
some people would would look at it assuming that um that there wasn't perhaps that that idea of togetherness with with the soldier um and I, I don't know what the original photographic image looked like in, in terms of positioning and, and where they were. From, from your description, I can kind of get a, a picture of it. But um, I think you've, you've moved around the, the positions no, of the I, people slightly, have you? No, I've, what I've done is uh, I've uh, taken the original uh, photograph and I've, um, I've uh, like printed it out and then I've drawn over it. So the position and is exactly the same, but oh, okay. the the original the original child was was a was a boy, not a girl. So then I extended mm. the hair, if you know what I mean. And I do quite a lot on that in my work. I sort of like to distort images that already exist, um, sort of, um, and then try and uh, plan to do some sort of collage. Martina, at the bottom of your piece, you've got a map of yeah. Ulster of um, yeah. the six counties. Is it? and yeah. it's upturned it's turned upside down there um was there some significance to that what was the the reason for your inclusion of that in that position and upturned like that well um the upturned bit was um basically representing you know what i mean how how our history turned around but the six counties are very important because it's 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 not actually the whole of ulster um there's another uh, there's County Donegal as well, so it represents, you know what I mean, the six counties with six counties um, which became Northern Ireland. And uh, my county's in the middle, which is Tyrone, which was the traditional seat of the kings of um, Ireland, the O'Neills. Um, but then Tyrone became very insignificant and became one of the poorest places to live and uh, still struggles. Um, the, the map also represents as a little indicator of the different languages spoken at the time because one of my interests is historical linguistics. Um, so I'm very interested in, you know, language origin, etc. So it represents the number of English speakers, then Irish speakers, and then Ulster Scots, because those are the three main language areas of Ulster, and it also has created a sort of um, a unique identity for us. From the rest of uh, the Republic of Ireland, for example, so is the the pain of politics and so on and so forth. But um, it represents how diverse we are and how much we are. You know, we share a history, four hundred years. So uh, yeah, yeah, that's a little map. Yeah, brilliant. And um, thanks for explaining. <laughs> um, yeah. Again, um, as I've said, it's on Twitter. Um, yeah, it's it's on my Twitter at Joshua Soro uh, as I posted it. But it's um, under the hashtag Voices of Today. And yeah, get on there and check it out. It, it really is a, a fantastic piece. Thank you, Martina. Um, Ravi, let's let's move on to you to um, to finish this off. Um, you submitted a, a video that you'd edited. You put together kind of like a montage video, I think you you would say, um, looking at some of the counterculture in Nottingham and pirate radio stations. Uh, it had audio behind it taken from some of those pirate radio station recordings, but it, uh, it also showed some, some nice images of Goose Fair, of the, uh, the newspaper stories that talked about the, the closures of pirate radio, um, and, a, and a few club scenes, a few, few raves in there as well. Yeah, um, yeah could, you, could you tell us a little bit about it, um, about what your your intentions were with that piece and and yeah how you put it together please yeah um pirate radio was really important and it it's not that important nowadays because there's a lot of streaming online there's a lot of people not listening to radio anymore but there's still a lot operating in london but nottingham had a very specific um pirate radio scene and this came from the jamaican scene and the, the sound systems that were in nottingham and uh basically They'd done blues parties previously in Forest Fields, Tyson Green, these areas, which were huge reggae parties where they'd get the big sound systems and they'd blast out the sound. They'd actually use the flats as a kind of speaker, giant speaker. And that would be on um, Monday night as well when everybody would get paid. So <laughs> they'd kind of all go out then. Um, what happened was there was a station called Heatwave Radio and Heatwave operated in a no-go area for the police. So the police would not enter Heisen Green because if they came in force, the community would be in uproar. There would be a lot of trouble. So they just wouldn't go there. And this 
led the pirate radio to operate for 12 years and it was the longest running consistent pirate radio in britain and uh heatwave was based at people's bakery and they made no uh, kind of hiding of the facts they basically talked about it straight away though but if you want to send us stuff send it to people's bakery and um that was when i was younger so when i was younger kind of 89 you'd hear heatwave and all the older stuff but then different communities came in and as music progressed a lot of stuff got banned in nottingham so there were not venues to play reggae music um uk garage i remember when uk garage came out they made a specific law that if there was any garage event in nottingham you had to have a van full of police officers so instantly the promoters were having to pay three thousand four thousand pounds on top of their kind of club night and stuff just to be able to run it so these pirates were essential for getting information out about where the raves were happening, the, the retailer stores as well. So there was independent record stores that would be stocking these tracks made by local artists on white labels. So people were getting their kind of sound out there. And then when text messaging came in, they were like a social network. People were texting in, you were recognizing numbers that they would say, they'd say the last three digits. So it would be, big shout to the 702 or the 194. And then it got even crazier when um, they do phone-ins on these stations. So um, it's got a long history. And I thought, you know, there's not many kids are going to know about the pirate radios and kind of understand sitting at home on a Friday night, tuning in before you're about to go out, listening to a, a pre-warm-up set, and then going out to the club and seeing all these guys you're hearing on the radio like live on stage and that kind of interactivity um doesn't really happen online anymore and there's not uh, a link between the physical and the yeah. um, kind of radio you know no and i think there's there's also something like really exciting about um the kind of ephemeral nature almost of it where you'd you'd listen to it on on radio and some people would make recordings of it of course and you'd get yeah. to, to hear it back and you'd go to school and people would be selling DJ sets um, that had been done on pirate radio over the weekend, uh, selling them at school. Um, but kind of more often than not, I think if you missed it, that was it. You missed it. Um, you hadn't you hadn't heard it. And if you'd been there live and seen seen a, a set at a rave, then you'd seen it. If you hadn't, you'd missed it. And that's kind of the difference, I think, with more um, marginalised musical genres and scenes that you you do have that ephemeral nature to it that feels a, a bit special that like you if you're there you know that you're one of the lucky few to kind of be involved in it and you don't you don't get that with more commercial or more uh, mainstream genres of music and, no. and music scenes and i think in nottingham there was a real kind of a unity vibe between different communities and the pirate radio so um the alternate that you'd have would be Trent Sounds or Trent Radio with Dale Winton. And uh, that was kind of very cheesy and stuff. Nobody <laughs> would really listen to that. But then we had um, a huge kind of scene between the Jamaican community and the punk community. So there was a big connection with ska, reggae. And we had an event called the Rock and Reggae that used to happen on the forest uh, recreation ground. And people... There'd be no barriers on the forest recreation ground. People used to just drive on with cars, get sound systems out and go, right, we're having a party tonight. And the council had no control over these parties or anything. It was <laughs> fantastic. And I used to live next to the forest. So I'd hear these bass lines as a kid. You know? so that's when it was truly a, a common, a real, a real common for people yeah, to be yeah. able to use as they wish. Yeah. Use um, that so common land. People would have big fires. That you know, loads of different events would happen. There'd be a um, lot of crusty techno kind of guys yeah, coming. Yeah, I remember Yeah, that came back from um, the the peace convoy, which was coming from Stonehenge, and um, these kind of free parties. And they also uh, hung around in forest fields. Suddenly, all these really cool vans started to appear with custom paintwork and stuff and they'd hold raves on the forest or in different locations all around nottingham as well so that that area of nottingham in particular is um really important um, in the history of 
community unity and counterculture um, and the link between the two there and another thing it's really famous for is the goose fair it hasn't always been there throughout history but nowadays the goose fair and for quite a while um has been held there um it features in your video as well where every uh, there, there's a a part of it that shows some footage and or some some photographs sorry and also some uh, radio talking about the goose fair um yeah there's a link there with with raves as well isn't there with the yeah so the the, the fairgrounds used to be used at a lot of the raves, so they would bring in the Ferris wheel, they'd bring in all these kind of crazy things, and people often high would go on them and <laughs> have a good time. <laughs> also, um, there was stuff like Helter Skelter was one of the big kind oh, of yeah. tape, tape packs that was all fairground themed. A lot of the music they play on the fair would be rave dancey and a lot of the guys would sound like mcs so uh they used to actually invite the pirate djs to come down there have a stall on this on the fair and meet the listeners and uh, that was an opportunity to come down and see them and uh that i've actually got a clip of that where they're saying come down and meet us at the fair <laughs> it's great you still get that at goose fair you still get those those guys on the on the rides with their microphones sounding like like MCs, garages, yeah. garages, <laughs> basically. <laughs> And yeah. with the uh, with 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 the music playing as well, which is amazing. Yeah, yeah. Um, it was that I'd whole never realized dance culture that kind of fit really well with the fairground aesthetic as well. Um, how how did you get that footage, Ravi? Um, a lot of it was uh, researching online. There's a really good archived pirate sites which show you the timetables of the pirate radios you know the flyers and newspaper clippings um all of this stuff and uh i kind of knew about some of the stations but i hadn't known about other ones so i looked through a, a historical kind of timeline and there seems to be a lot of people archiving pirate radio which uh, is really interesting because I, I i think it's great even listening back now you hear adverts for like the 3210 phone being like 400 pounds. You can't believe it. And <laughs> <laughs> all these local Nottingham produced adverts, which are really hilarious as well. And uh, <laughs> FM is uh, actually a result of all of these pirates because Kemet FM has now been licensed and that's a, a, a community station um, for the black community. And it's about its actual name, Kemet, comes from the period of um, the Egyptian empire when it was ruled by uh black as they called them nubian people then and uh yeah kemet is now one of the shining kind of uh independent radios in the country and that's all because of the pirate history and heatwave and a lot of the djs that played on these pirates now play on kemet as well yeah it's, it's good that there's a continuation of that and i think that maybe maybe now in this time um when we're seeing a lot of community cohesion people coming together a bit more one of the positives to come out of this i'm hoping and going back to what we were talking about earlier around what might come out of this situation and what what art might come out of it i guess i'm hoping that there'll be a lot more community driven art projects and perhaps more in the way of parties and radio again how that happens with social distancing is yet to be to be seen but um yeah perhaps we'll have like two meter parties the forest wreck's big enough like, I know, I know. <laughs> We different communities collaborating and... i think that's that's, that's the way each. to go <laughs> sorry martina tree each we're just have one tree each that's it yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like one of the biggest communities i loved back then was um uh they called it bangra muffin and that was a mix between the asian sound and the jamaican sound as well and uh, that was when uh, apache indian was out and stuff and uh, there was lots of these crossover kind of sounds and they all created something new and exciting and it's all it's all diy isn't it because uh, when, when you have um restrictions on culture when you have um suppression of movements and of communities um people aren't left with any choice but to to do it themselves and to, to come up with their own tech in terms of just building their own speakers or, or computers um, and their own styles and those communities become really fertile breeding grounds for for great culture that comes out of them um, and I think you've talked as well a little bit about some of the other DIY um, elements from that time 80s 90s 
Yeah, so the skate, um, the skate scene as well, I think was. Yeah, um, really when I was a kid, we were always building skate ramps all around Nottingham, and actually Nottingham's now had a few skate parks introduced, but there was a piece of land near the a railway station that was uh, actually turned into the biggest. If you search for it on YouTube, it's amazing. DIY Nottingham skate park it is one of the biggest homemade skate parks in the whole country, and. Uh, it's just fantastic. Even though they had this place that you go to pay for, they'd prefer to actually go to their own main skating place away from everyone. Really cool stuff. Phil, Phil, you're a skater as well, aren't you? Have you, um, have you been there? I'm an old man skater. I don't think it, does it still exist? No, it, it got <laughs> destroyed and then rebuilt and then destroyed again. <laughs> yeah, I don't, yeah, I don't know. There's a really, there's a nice little DIY spot in Grantham actually under a little bridge that I, that I discovered the other day. Um, but yeah, I, I, I know I know all about that spot, and I'm gutted that it's not there anymore. Never yeah, got to see it. Uh, I saw in America they were doing this thing where they were actually cementing in the ramps, and if there was a part, they would expand it to huge levels, and the council would kind of just have to accept it because <laughs> oh, <I> like that <laughs> giant concrete ones. Yeah. <laughs> well, I think. That's a, that's a good example to, to finish on, really, is that um, out of times when you are restricted for whatever reason that may be, whether it's a military occupation or it's uh, a pandemic locking you in your houses or it's um, racist policy um, crushing communities and stopping them from putting out the music that they want to, uh, things thrive and things come out of that because people come together. It's not what we want. We don't want those situations, uh, but it something about it makes people come together and and do something artistic and and creative and i think and i hope that this situation's gonna gonna show us some really cool things um thank you all for for joining in this discussion and for submitting your art in the first place to the voices of today project um i know all of you personally and i'm, I'm gonna have conversations with all of you that go on beyond this i'm sure uh, i'll be really interested to see how your art responds further to this situation uh, but for now um, we're going to leave it there um, thank you to not stopping festival and um, from nottingham castle trust uh, with left line assisting uh, thank you very much and that's all for today cheers everyone oh, thank you very much guys lovely to meet you thanks josh yeah you bye. too bye it's, it's really interesting bye